to talk about giants on the North American continent. It's kind of a controversial subject, but there does exist a, a lot of evidence, even though for whatever reason it has been systematically covered up by academia. It was the late 1800s and the early 1900s. There were many excavations done as well as incidental finds when farmers were filling up their fields or hunters were exploring the woods hunting. The sensationalism of some finds may have sparked some frauds or some hoaxes, but there are hundreds of newspaper articles and photographs of these giants. I probably would just pass it off as sensationalism of the media at the time if it were not for some of my personal experiences that hit a little bit closer to home. I have a good friend who has personally seen some of these red-haired giant they were mummies. My friend is a, an equipment operator that clears area for drilling, for oil field drilling and mining. And in one of these sites, when he was clearing or excavating the site, they uncovered some some of these mummies and they had to abandon that location and move to a different location. It was on private property. The private property owner did not want to disclose to the government or anybody else what they had found and so they quietly moved to another location. Because of this we have been unable to take photographs or get samples because he doesn't want his property to be invaded by the Smithsonian or federal agents or, or whatever the case may be. I think there's two reasons that the stigma of these giants has been covered up. And one of the stigmas relates to the acceptance of academia on the evolutionary process. Their fostering of this scientific theory that has never been proven. They have absolutely no evidence of evolution. And I know this because my major was anthropology. And on many occasions I confronted professors or different lecturers about this very thing and no one could give me any proof or evidence of evolution from species to species. Now we do have a lot of change within species based upon circumstances, the environment, the isolated gene pool of an area. And so there are adaptations and significant changes that occur within species over time. But we have absolutely no evidence whatsoever of a species to species change in the entire evolutionary chain. The DNA is not the same. Even with, it, say, a chimpanzee, we have 98% the same DNA, but we also have, you know, 94% the same DNA as a pig. So evidence does not show change from one species to another, but rather adaptation and change within species. These red-haired giants, I, I, you hear the term red-haired giants. They weren't all red-haired giants. There were blonde-haired giants, there were dark-haired giants, there were giants of all size from six feet seven all the way up to some claims as much as 12 feet tall. Just as in today's the dominant traits in a gene pool, the red hair is a dominant trait that is passed on more readily than dark hair or blonde hair the red-haired trait being the dominant trait, once a isolated group of individuals or people have that trait among them, that is going to be the predominant trait that shows up. Some more anomalies that we have seen, and I'm going to show some photographs of this, among these giants are six fingers and six toes and, and two rows of teeth on some of these, these giants. It's interesting to note that in the Bible, 
We also have references to giants that had six fingers and six toes. I think the other reason that science has attempted to cover up this evidence of giants is because it does not fit their narrative. It doesn't fit the narrative that cavemen came across the Bering Strait and, and, and started to inhabit uh, the North American continent 10,000 years ago. Um, they do not know where these red-haired giants came from. They do not know how they showed up. They cannot explain their advanced technology. They had advanced mineralogy. They were working metals, copper. There's evidence of steel. They had a lot of uh, implements made out of copper and bronze. They had swords. They had helmets. They had breastplates. They had leaflets. They had all kinds of armor. They had decorative uh, copper sheets. They were often buried with sheets of mica or different minerals that had been cut with metal tools. I can see the sheer the the copper streaks on some of these sheets. So they had technology earlier than other Native American tribes on the North American continent. This does not fit the narrative of slow steady progress and advancement of technology. Science doesn't like to admit that civilizations and technology rise and fall is gained and lost with succeeding generations. That doesn't fit their narrative, but that's the narrative that we have seen. That's what the fossil record shows. That's what archaeological digs all across this world has shown is that civilizations rise and fall, whether from disease or war or natural calamity, catastrophe, technology is learned and lost and we start over again. Another reason for academia to reject the discovery of giants is because religious records show or talk about these giants and for academia to show the public these individuals, these finds, they would have, they would inevitably come under scrutiny of these historical records such as the Bible. And some of these, and, and the Bible predates by thousands of years these discoveries. Because of the narrative and because of the things that it, academia does not want to accept these giants in our historical record. And I have personally seen these things when I was a young anthropologist at several dig sites. I saw many times things that were entered into the records or things that were left out of the records because they could not establish a context or because it did not fit the narrative that they wanted there. It did not fit the narrative that they were trying to foster with their fundraising groups. It did not fit the narrative that they were trying to establish with their record. A civilization to show up that was older, more advanced, had metallurgy, had highly skilled methods of building, orientation with the, uh, uh, the astronomy, with the stars, um, the technology to build these giant mounds, much of the Building materials that were at some of these sites were brought in from hundreds of miles away to build these mounds. Another thing that, that the discovery of these mound builders, these giants, in the northern, northeastern United States, there are many up in Minnesota and Canada, there are many copper mines that were mined for the copper and thousands, if not millions, of tons of ore have been removed from those mines. And it would be easy for science to figure out where that ore went from, went, went to. In fact, one of my beliefs is that this ore, this copper ore, was what funded the Bronze Age all across the world. But for science and academia to accept that and to publish that, that would destroy their narrative that indigenous species came across the Bering Sea land bridge during the Ice Age. 
Um, it would not fit the narrative that the Vikings and the Minoans and all these peoples from all over the world, the Romans, um, had come here to obtain copper to fund for the Bronze Age, for building swords and shields and breastplates and helmets and all kinds of tools and instruments. And we know from geology that the mining, the gold, the silver, the copper, the ore, or the metals that make up these tools or these jewelry or treasure or instruments or anything that's created out of ore can be traced back to its origin. The microscopic properties of the mineral are like a fingerprint. They can be traced to their origin and it would be simple for scientists to take samples of different ores from different locations and then go to Europe, South America, all over North America and trace the origins of these, this metallurgy to determine where it was mined. The fact that they have not done this is one more evidence that they do not want the public or they don't even want to tackle that particular subject. Um, I'm going to backtrack a little bit because I wanted to tell of one other experience with these giants that's not widespread. I live on the Arizona Strip area and not too far away from here is the town of Kanab, Utah. Uh, back in the early 1900s uh, there were several of these giants that were found. They were mummies. Some of them were buried in, in pits in the fetal position and some of them were laid out in graves uh, wrapped in cedar bark and, and placed with clay and gravel over the top of them and well preserved, they were well preserved mummies. One of these was an eight and a half foot tall mummy that the locals found when they were out exploring and they took it back to the hardware store and it was stood up against the hardware store as a novelty, as a thing to get tourists and travelers to stop and, and go into the hardware store. And so I've seen photographs of that. We know of the Lovelock Caves, which are not too far away to the west, out on the, uh, the desert there. Um, they were found in a cave by individuals that were digging guano. They were digging bat manure to, for fertilizer. And they discovered these mummies buried in this cave. The local Paiutes have a oral legend, an oral tradition that their tribe was warring. They were fighting back and forth with these red-haired giants. One of the traditions was that these giants were actually cannibalistic. And the Paiutes were afraid of them and were always battling with them. And one time they trapped these giants in this cave, Lovelock Cave, and attempted to, to kill them, but the giants wouldn't come out of the cave. So the Paiutes stacked wood against the entrance of the cave and lit it on fire. And basically um, they died from either heat or smoke, inhalation or whatever, but they were trapped in this cave and, and killed. And basically, when they discovered these giants, that's what they found. I mean, this cave had, had been uh, basically just set on fire, and these mummies were found in the back of the cave, buried in ash, and, and uh, looked like they had been singed, some of them. And the skeletal remains of these mummies remained in a museum in Nevada for many years until later dates and then they were subsequently hidden or put in a back room for whatever, for whatever reason. And, but we do have photographs of those. We have uh, witnesses that saw those mummies and it's a, it's a documented find documented by local individuals and, and um, scientists. Almost every Native American tribe on the uh, North American continent has traditions and oral histories 
um, pictorial, <clears throat> excuse me, pictorial records, petroglyphs, pictographs, panels in their cave drawings or in their rock art that depicts giants or an enemy that's large and strangely dressed. Anthropologists have attributed these things to their quote-unquote gods, the gods of these tribes. But when you talk to these individuals or you listen to their oral traditions or you understand the glyphs, you realize that these individuals were not their gods. And there's too much evidence. I mean, there's literally thousands of newspaper articles, thousands of photos from that particular time period in the 1800s, the mid, the early to mid, the, to even some in the late 1800s, where these giants were excavated in, in high numbers. Everywhere from, from Virginia all the way to um, the coastal islands in California.